Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 33, where we are going to be continuing on in our series here in the Gospel of Matthew. You know, there is this notion or thinking among many North Americans that with modernization, the world is becoming less religious. For those of us who have lived here for the last few decades in Canada, we might actually be tempted to agree. You know that in 1867, when the Fathers of Confederation named our country, they called it the Dominion of Canada. Not just because they wanted some autonomy from the British Crown, but because one of them, Sir Leonard Tilley, had actually been inspired by Psalm 72, verse 8, which reads like this, He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. You know, the current Education Act of Ontario Public Schools to this day actually still reflects this Christian heritage as it states in 264-1, it is the duty of a teacher to teach diligently and inculcate by precept and example respect for religion and the principles of Judeo-Christian morality and the highest regard for truth, justice, loyalty, love of country, humanity, benevolence, sobriety, industry, frugality, purity, temperance, and all other virtues. I'm not sure how many teachers think about that these days, but it's there in the Ontario public school system. Do you know that our anthem, O Canada, actually comes from a poem that was written by Robert Stanley Weir and that it has four verses to it? The first one we know very well, which is O Canada, our home and native land. But there is a final verse to it, and it goes like this. Ruler supreme, who hearest humble prayer, hold our dominion within thy loving care. Help us to find, O oh God, in thee a lasting rich reward, as waiting for the better day we ever stand on guard. Most of us don't know of this God-centered last verse of the poem. You know, the rich Christian heritage that we have actually gave rise to our justice system as we know it today. It shaped our ethics, the laws of our land. It gave birth to our charitable enterprises. All this was largely evaporated in the face of an increasingly secularized society and also, I would say, a compromised church that has abandoned the authority and the importance of the Word of God. But just because we see this happening around us in Canada does not mean that this is happening everywhere. There was a major Pew Research study from 2015 that projected that in the United States, uh, Christians will actually decline from more than three-quarters of the population measured in 2010 to two-thirds by the year 2050. However, the number of Christians globally is expected to increase in its projection from 2.17 billion to 2.92 billion in the next 30 years. By 2050, it says that four out of every 10 Christians in the world will live in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, what's fascinating, actually, about their research study was that although they note that the number of people professing no religion or the unaffiliated, that includes agnostics and others, is going to increase from 1.13 billion to 1.23 billion, this will actually represent a drop from 16.4% of the world's population to 13.2% of the world's population. They state this, atheists, agnostics, and other people who do not affiliate with any religion, though increasing in countries such as the United States and France, will make up a declining share of the world's total population. You, know, you read that and you realize, you know what it's saying? In other words, it says irreligiousness is actually on the decline, contrary to what you might intuitively expect living here in Canada. It will be decreasing over the course of three, the next three decades if the projections are correct. And Christianity isn't declining. What's happening is actually that it's growing and it's shifting its locus 
and it's growing cross-culturally and globally. And the question we need to ask is, why exactly is this happening? Now, there's multiple good reasons for why this is happening from a practical perspective, but the short answer is this. Why is Christianity growing? Because Jesus said it would. He promised that his kingdom would grow, even though it would start very small, and eventually take over to the very ends of the earth itself, and it would become so very great. See, do you know what the hallmark is of the true gospel of Jesus Christ? The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 4 to 5. He says, For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. See, Christianity is not some idea that you keep in your head. The gospel that comes through God's word is a power that brings conviction and transformation to the human heart. And when you understand this deeply in your heart that Jesus Christ came to save you and that you are a sinner and that he spared you from the wrath of God by taking your place at Calvary's cross and offers you hope of a new life in him, if you really get that, that gets down deep into your heart, that will change your fundamental reasons for doing the things that you do. As an individual, you will be transformed. And if enough people in a society are transformed, the society is transformed and changed as well. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not some sort of add-on philosophy that you try to adhere to or incorporate into your life to help you try to improve your life. The gospel is news about the inbreaking of the kingdom of God and how the king is coming into the world to perform major heart surgery on people who are terminally ill. It's the best possible news in the world. It's not self-help advice. It is an eternal intervention. Everything will be forever changed if you believe it. You can't stop it. There's three things I'd like to consider in our text as we read today, as we look at this parable of the mustard seed and the leaven. One is I want us to think about, one, the breadth of the kingdom. Two, I want us to think about the blessings of the kingdom. And thirdly, I'd like us to look and see at the power of the kingdom. Okay? With your Bibles open or on the screen, let's begin by reading Matthew 13, verses 31 to 33. The text says this. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Now, Just prior to this, Jesus has given two agricultural parables to teach about the kingdom. We looked at them in the previous weeks in the first parable about the four soils. He explains about the responses to the kingdom. That is, responses to the kingdom will range from complete rejection to complete acceptance of him. In the next agricultural parable of the wheat and the weeds, Jesus teaches on the mixed nature of the kingdom, at least for now. There will be a judgment that he teaches coming later in which those who follow him and believe in God will be separated from those who don't, but that won't occur until the end of the age. Here in this third agricultural parable, Jesus is teaching about the breadth of the kingdom. He's saying here that, you know, it's going to start very, very small, like a tiny little mustard seed, but inexplicably will grow until it's absolutely enormous. Now, although the text doesn't specify exactly what this plant is, many scholars think that it is probably either the black or the white mustard plant that was common in the area at the time. Its seeds really were truly minuscule, really only about a millimeter in width. The plant itself could grow as a shrub 
very large like shop that was almost tree-like, being over 10 feet tall in some cases. You know, it's interesting that Jewish literature of the time confirms the idea that this use of a mustard seed as the smallest of things was proverbial in the time of Jesus. Mishnah Taharot 8.8, which is about purity laws, contains there a reference to food that is the size of a mustard seed. Mishnah Nida 5.2 talks about how even a tiny amount of bodily fluid, it says the size of a mustard seed really can make one ceremonially unclean. Now, it's interesting, in modern times, we don't really care about Jewish law, but people have looked at this and tried to argue and say, see, the Bible here is full of errors. It's an old book as well that uh, is anachronistic and, uh, and doesn't quite understand scientific knowledge of its day. And they claim that it made a mistake here because Jesus said that the mustard seed was the smallest of all seeds. Don't you know, they would say, modern botany tells us that orchids actually have seeds that are much, much smaller. Or perhaps it's leveled at the Bible. Maybe Jesus knew it was wrong, but he spoke this way to accommodate the Jewish erroneous beliefs of their time. Now, I don't think that either of these statements are correct. See, I don't think Jesus is making an absolute statement here about all seeds on the face of the earth. See, this is not a biology class from the future, right? If you look carefully at the context, Jesus says here that when it grows up, it'll be larger than all the garden plants. So when he says it's the smallest here of all seeds, he means that in relation to what the Jews would have known and what they would have planted in their herb or their vegetable gardens. You know, it's interesting, while studying for this, I read this fascinating excerpt from a private interview from 1968 given by Dr. L. H. Shinners, a professor of botany at the Southern Methodist University, who grew their herbarium from some 20,000 specimens to 340,000 by the end of his time. He said, quote, The mustard seed would indeed have been the smallest of those likely to have been noticed by the people at the time of Christ. The principal field crops, such as barley, wheat, lentils, and beans, have much larger seeds, as do vetches and the other plants. The only modern crop plant of importance with smaller seeds than mustard is tobacco. But this plant is of American origin and was not grown in the old world until the 16th century and later. In absolute terms, the number of species in Christ's time was almost the same as at the present, the cheap differences being the disappearance of some, mostly in quite modern times, and the development of hybrids or garden varieties which are not true species. See, Dr. Schinner's point is this. Jesus was not ignorant or dumb. He knew what he was talking about. It really was the smallest garden herb seed that the Jews would have known about at the time, and therefore we can trust his words. But that aside, this isn't the main point actually here. You know, the first thing I think that we learn from this parable of the mustard seed, like I said earlier, is that the, the, about the breadth of the kingdom, and that the kingdom, though it may start impossibly small, will grow to be something that is impossibly large. See, all the Jews in the day thought that the kingdom of God, reading the Old Testament, would come with great fanfare and pomp, excitement, the destruction of people who were the enemies of God. They thought that Jesus is here to free them from Roman occupation. And you can get a hint of that when you read John chapter 6, verse 15, which tells us that after Jesus performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000 with just Two little fishes and five loaves of bread. Some of you have sung that as kids. They were so amazed by this that they decided that they were going to make him king by force. So you imagine that you've got a guy who can heal at will, including lifelong injuries like paraplegia, that he can revive those who are on their last legs in need of modern-day life support. He has the ability to take a child's lunchbox and convert that into enough food to feed a brigade of 5,000 soldiers. I mean, if we knew that about Jesus and he was walking around here today in Vancouver, many Canadians would seize him and say, let's make this guy king of our country or prime minister tomorrow. No more waiting. No more 18 months for hip replacements in Canada. Jesus would fix that. Free food without raising government taxes or more debt. I mean, 
At that point, we could even raise a Canadian army and take over California and have Disneyland for ourselves. Who could stop us? Let's go, Jesus. But that's everyone's ambitions, worldly ambitions. The text tells us that's not what Jesus did. Jesus withdrew to a mountain to be by himself. Why? Because this was not God's plan for how his kingdom would grow. Small, not revolutionary. You know, Jesus' plan was not for his kingdom to advance through a brutal military coup, but slowly, bit by bit, with love and with life-on-life ministry, taking over human hearts one by one. And though it would start impossibly small, Jesus promised that it would grow so that it would be impossible to ignore. That's the nature of the kingdom of God. God's work may look underwhelming initially, but it will always bear fruit and become overwhelming. Why? Because the kingdom work is not the power of human beings. It is grounded in the power of God Almighty Himself. You know, Adoniram Judson was a missionary who at 25 years old left America in 1813 to reach the Burmese people with the gospel. If anyone knew about suffering and difficulty in ministry, it was him. It took him six years to baptize his first convert, and during those early years, him and his wife Anne suffered the loss of all three of their children. Adoniram was imprisoned for almost two years. He escaped being killed multiple times. His wife died of fever And then his infant daughter died shortly afterwards. Seventeen years in, he had only a handful of converts. His family was all dead, and he was living in isolation, wrestling through grief and praying to God. I mean, what hope do you turn to when everything that you have on earth is gone? Do you wonder, like, if your work has any value at the end of the day? You know, today... The Burmese church, looking at the Baptist convention alone, counts 1.7 million members, many of them who can trace their lineage, spiritual lineage, back to the work of Adoniram Judson. See, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And we need to believe that as Christians. And the second thing here that we learn about is the blessings of the kingdom. Look with me again at verse 32. We learn about this tree here that that covers many things. I think what it's teaching here is that the kingdom will be a blessing to all kinds of people. You know, Jesus notes that the mustard seed becomes a great tree-like thing that's so large that the birds of the air actually come and they make their nests in it. Now, what's interesting is that this phrase here about the birds of the air dwelling in its branches is almost identical to the Greek translation of Daniel chapter 4. If you know Daniel 4, it's Daniel is interpreting the dream of the mighty Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. And he tells him in his dream, I know you saw this great tree, but this great tree that's about to be chopped down, that's actually you, O king. And the birds, when you read that dream, are actually the other nations that have come to shelter themselves under the mighty empire of Babylon at the time. Now, there's another passage in the Old Testament that's very similar to this, but it's not about a pagan kingdom, but it's about the kingdom of the Messiah. Ezekiel 17, verses 22 to 24 says this, Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar." And under it will dwell every kind of bird in the shade of its branches. Birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. Dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. You know, in the context of the book of Ezekiel, God is prophesying that he's going to take a branch or this sprig, which is his Messiah, and plant him on a high and lofty mountain in Israel so that everyone's going to notice him and every creature 
and every nation in the world is going to dwell under his protection. That is his kingdom. It's a foretaste of the Messiah's kingdom to come. See, it's this rich imagery from the Old Testament that helps us to understand what Jesus means in this parable. His point here is that the kingdom of God was anticipated in the Old Testament, and it truly is going to be magnificent. It's not going to be short-lived like that kingdom of Babylon. But just as the nations of the world found their shelter under Babylon's empire for a time, the nations of the world, all the people will come one day, and they will find shelter under the wings of the Messiah, who won't just be there for the Jews, but will be there for the whole world. See, the kingdom of God will be huge as the church grows and all sorts of people eventually become beneficiaries of it. Now, I know that some of you might have read that there are those who have argued that the birds here really are non-Christians who are agents of the devil who are invading the church because in the previous parable there was something about birds that ate the seed of the word of God. Here, I just want to say that reading the context of the parable, the image of the birds is not a negative one. I think it's a positive one. The birds are nesting. They're, they're finding enjoyment under the shade of this tree. They're beneficiaries of the kingdom. And given that the, the nations, and Daniel, uh, are, uh, that Daniel speaks about nations, and also Matthew is an emphasis on the Gentile missions, I think this is really about fulfilling the promise to Abraham that his descendants, and ultimately his great descendant, Jesus Christ, will be a blessing to all the families and the nations of this earth. So in other words, the kingdom will offer benefits to people who weren't just Jews, but to Gentiles like you and me all across the globe. You know what's fascinating is that Christianity is perhaps the most culturally diverse and broad-reaching major world religion that exists today. There was a Gordon Conwell Seminary article from 2020 that noted that 73% of the global Christian population is represented by the top 50 languages of the world. In other words, Christianity is not confined to one particular group or ethno-linguistic background. Unlike Islam, which is heavily tied to Arabic, Hinduism to Sanskrit, Judaism to Hebrew, Christianity has always moved worship, the praise of God, teaching into the local language and customs of the people. See, there's nothing like this in the rest of the world. Only Christianity does this. And the gospel is for all people, all nations, all kinds of individuals who will come to know him. Third thing, I want us to look at the kingdom here. Back to verse 33, the power of the kingdom. You know, the kingdom, as I said earlier, is not a concept, but is powerful and it transforms people. You know, Jesus tells another parable in verse 33 here, likening the kingdom of God to leaven which a woman hid into a large amount of flour. Now, some have argued here that the leaven here all represents evil. But I think the context here makes it very clear that the leaven is positive. It's not negative. Like leavening, those of you who are bakers know that you put it into bread and it causes bread to rise and it becomes soft, fluffy, and enjoyable to eat. If you're not good at baking like I was in the past and probably still am as well, you make unleavened bread or you put the wrong proportion of ingredients, it becomes flat, hard, and horrible to serve your guests, only good for playing baseball or hockey with. Leavening was a good thing to put in here. And Jesus' point about the leavening working through all of the dough here is that it had a positive effect, and so the kingdom of God would also start small, but it would have a massive transformative effect on the world. Now, scholars think here that the three measures of flour is probably, three measures of flour probably in modern day terms is about 50 pounds of flour, which basically would have been enough food to feed 50 to 100, 150 people more. You know, it's not for a household to eat. This is not mom making dinner. This is someone preparing for a banquet. And Jesus is saying, that's exactly what my kingdom is going to be like. It's going to start tiny, but guess what? It's going to reach banquet-like proportions by the time it is done. It's going to be a feast for people to consume. God has an abundance for this world. It will inevitably permeate and absolutely transform this world. See, the parable here of the leaven 
teaches us about the methods of the kingdom. The kingdom of God will not grow through terrorization, but through transformation. And this is critical when it comes to understanding true biblical Christianity. Now, certainly there are people who have been done horrible things in the name of Christ in the past, Spanish Inquisitions, the brutal crusades of the Catholic Church. But these actions are actually incongruent with biblical Christianity. They don't represent Jesus. The only sword that we are permitted to carry is not the physical one to advance the faith, but it's the spiritual one, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, the one that we are allowed to take and that we speak it to people and that we stab them with it. We don't kill them, but we bring them actually to life instead. As they hear the truth about Jesus, their hearts are transformed by his love, and they give their lives to him instead. See, the weapons of our warfare are not for taking life, but giving it. And we give of our lives so that others may be bettered. And this is what Christians have done all throughout the centuries, giving of themselves so that others could find true life. You know, Christians helped change a culture of death in the ancient world. Ancient Rome was known for its bloody gladiatorial fights. Theodora, who was the bishop of Cyrus, actually who lived, uh, Cyrus, who lived in Syria in the 5th century, actually documents the story of a martyr by the name of Telemachus, a holy Christian man who was so horrified by the bloodied entertainment in the arena that he actually walked into the arena himself and called for the gladiators and the people to put down their arms and to stop killing each other. And the story goes that the crowd was furious at this for him interrupting their entertainment, and they killed him there on the spot. But when the emperor heard about this martyr's death, he actually put an end to the games. You know, Christianity has also transformed the lives of countless men, women, and children. You know, in the ancient Roman world, the father of the pater familias, the head of the household, had absolute rights over the children. He could kill them if he wanted to. And generally, a wife was considered to be his property as well. And then along comes Christianity with its message. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. See, this would have been absolutely shocking in their culture for Roman men to hear this. God was teaching them through his word that these women aren't your property, they are co-heirs with you, equal in value before an almighty God. And you mistreat your one flesh wife, whom you're commanded to love and nourish just as Jesus Christ does his church. God himself will turn his face from you and will not answer your prayers. See, ladies, the ideal husband is a man who trembles at God's word. Ephesians 6 verse 4 gave instruction to Christian fathers. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You know, in the ancient Roman world that the gospel began circulating in, fathers were notoriously absent from child rearing, absent from family life. They were either working all the time or self-entertaining. It's funny, right? Because it's really no different from the tropes of the modern men who like to sit around pursuing their own hobbies, playing video games, or hiding in man caves. Some of you might be old enough, like me, to remember a famous series of Budweiser commercials that went like, what's up? Bunch of friends hanging around, drinking beer with each other, watching the big game. And then in comes God into this culture and says, nope, that's not my picture of a man and a husband and a father. No neglecting your kids or being harsh with them. The commandment for you is to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You are not permitted to check out of child rearing. Christianity changed the culture by changing the family and offering men a true model for how they were to be fathers and husbands by looking at the God-man Jesus Christ. The gospel, in turn, gives society with redeemed husbands and fathers who model to people around them lives 
not after the fashion of men or whatever men idealize in their culture, but after the image of Jesus Christ, a man who gave up of his own life so that others could live. You get a bunch of men like that, saved, converted, redeemed, they'll change their families, they will change society. You know, Christianity also didn't just transform the social aspects you know, of the world, but it transformed the world also in the area of medicine and Christian service. You know, the first free dispensary of medicine, medical supplies was founded by Apollonius, who was a Christian merchant. That was the first London drugs, in case you're wondering. The first civic hospital founded by Fabiola, a Christian lady who supported it out of her own means. In the third century, during the plague of Cyprian, when the plague was at its height, killing 5,000 people a day in Rome, Bishop Dionysius wrote this about what Christians did. He says, heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy. For they were infected with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Many in nursing and curing others transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. Isn't that beautiful? And everyone else is running for their lives because of the plague. The Christians stayed, served, and died with joy in their hearts, departing this life happy, serenely happy. I mean, how do you do such a thing? You can do this when you realize that Jesus Christ took your terminal disease of sin onto himself to give you eternal life that you did not deserve. And if he did that for you, can you not offer up your physical body, yes, even your entirety of your life, to serving him? I mean, what do you have to fear? Death is only the passage from life into a greater form of eternal life. You want to know what will drive people in our society to care more for others, to serve them, even if it costs them their own lives? It's the gospel. You get this deep down in your heart, what Jesus has done for you, you will change. And in changing, you will change your society. You know, Christianity is responsible for m these massive changes, massive good in society. Modern universities, our Western system of law owes itself as well to this foundation in Christianity. The idea of the inherent dignity and equality of all human beings is founded in the Bible. So, you know, when people say things to me like, well, I, I don't really like religion because I feel like religion uh, only leads to war, fighting, and arguments. We should all just get along. I would look at them and I would just say, have you even read what history has to say about what true Christians have done? There's no denying the incredible transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ on a person's life and how Christianity has made societies better. History actually bears witness to this. Jesus said it would happen, and today his followers went our number in the billions. A ragtag group of of 120 people huddled together for prayer shortly after his death, full of individuals who came from all walks of life, not scholars or the religious elite, now has grown into a worldwide global movement. If you were a betting person, you wanted to put odds on that, nobody would have bet on that. But when it comes to the power of God, unstoppable. What happened and what began as something that was unnoticed now cannot help but be noticed because of the power of God. You know, brothers and sisters, you know, as we wrap this up, you know, I just want to say to us that we as Christians should not have a siege-type mentality in the world. I know there's many who are like want to close themselves off in communes and say, we need to protect ourselves right now. The world is getting in. And, and what if it takes over the church? It's good for us to think through what it is that we believe but the world will never ultimately take over the church of Jesus Christ. Our mindset actually should be one of triumph and victory because Jesus promised that his church would spread to the very ends of the earth and only then would the end come. You know, Jesus promised us that his kingdom is going to have unparalleled breadth, it's going to have worldwide blessing, and it would consist of soul-transforming power. And he has privileged you and I to be ambassadors on his behalf, preaching the good news to people and bringing them to life. 
The question that we have to ask ourselves, though, is do we see that value? Do we consider Christ to be that valuable, his work? And will we be his followers and take up our crosses and preach the good news? See, if you see Jesus as supremely valuable, if you see him there as hanging on the cross, bleeding and dying for your sins, if you see that he restored that ruptured relationship between the Father and you and gave you the hope of eternal life, that will change you. It will change you because you will understand just how much you've been loved and how much you've been forgiven of, and therefore you can invest your life in the things of eternity. See, how we live matters. And Jesus' promise, Jesus gives each and every one of us a task to do and to be a part of changing the world. You know, I'm sure there are hard days where I have asked myself, is the ministry worth it? Is following Jesus worth it? What would we like maybe just to take a regular job once again and work nine to five and have evenings and weekends back, have a long weekend, have stat holidays, possibilities for promotions, building fun projects. Maybe I get to work on the next chat GPT, you know, AI that takes over the world. That'd be fun for me, but... Is it worth it at the end of the day? You know, as I was writing on this and thinking it through in my own soul, what do I live for? I was reflecting on the ministry of Wayne and Gail Chen. Wayne was actually Esther's neighbor growing up on the same block in Burnaby. However, he eventually went to do ministry in Silicon Valley, but chose to leave that comfortable lifestyle behind in 2009. And with very, very young kids, and a wife, he headed to Beam Island, which is in Papua New Guinea. Tiny little thing, like three kilometers long. It's a volcanic island. You've probably never even heard of it. Can't even find it on a map. Beam Island to share the gospel with an unreached people group. For three years, Wayne and Gail labored to create an alphabet, and they taught the people how to read and write their own language. They established a church, and they baptized 11 people in year four Seven years in, they ordained the first elders of the church. And the crazy part of this was two years in, living on an island with no running water, no electricity, none of the modern conveniences of Silicon Valley, Gail was diagnosed with breast cancer. And throughout this whole time, through prayer and trips back and forth to the mainland, battling stage three breast cancer, they stayed and they continued to do the work of planting the church. And God was with them and used their very battle with cancer to touch the hearts of the people as they suffered and served them there. Wayne writes this, that several of the ladies said this to Gail, wrote this in a letter. Gail, when you first got cancer back in 2011, the whole community was extremely sad. When you came back with just one breast, we did not know how to accept it. But when we heard about your cancer coming back a few months ago, sometime, somehow this time we feel different. Yes, we are still sad when we think about it. We are not really sad. We are happy for you because you finished the work that God had marked for you. The rest of the community are still dead, which is, they write, a beam way of describing those who have not believed. So they are sad, but we know better. You were with us when we were little kids in the spiritual sense. Somehow when we heard about your sick coming back again, we just thought that God's timing was perfect. We know that the work you've done for God has carried fruit. We are your fruit. So we can't be sad as if we have no hope. We know we will see you in heaven again. So now we feel like, Gail, you can go to heaven now because you have finished what God has marked for you to do. We will be sad, but happy at the same time. Wayne said that those words hit him so hard, and it moved him deeply. Not because they were saying, okay, now you can die, wife. No, it's not it. But he was moved because the beam believers were seeing things through a biblical lens through redeemed eyes. Wayne said this, in their eyes, the biggest tragedy isn't merely a life ending too soon. Living longer isn't a triumph over death in itself or worth celebrating, but a life 
wholly given to the purpose of our Redeemer is worth celebrating, no matter the longevity. These are the words from Paul to the Ephesian elders. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. See, that's what happens when you really get the gospel, when it goes down deep. You know, in another interview, Wayne said this, when our lives are used by God, it might not be comfortable. It might not go according to our plans, but I don't want to invest in just the next 20 to 30 years of my life. I want to invest in the next 2,000 or 20,000 years. And to that, my heart says, yes, Wayne, yes, you got it. A long life in it of itself is not worth celebrating but a life wholly given over to Jesus' work, no matter how short, is. See, my life is also worth nothing to me if only I too might finish the course that the Lord Jesus has laid out for me. As a minister of the gospel, to preach the good news, to shepherd people in his name, the task of testifying to the grace of God that was given to me. I look at Silicon Valley where Wayne came from and I have to say, as I keep look at not at earthly things but on the things that are above, as I plan not for my retirement in 20 and, 20 and 30 years but my eternal retirement in 20,000 and 30,000 years, I look at what this world has to offer. Silicon Valley, $200,000 U.S., which is a few billion Canadian, right? Salary for senior software engineers and all the perks that go with it. And I say, that's chump change. That's monopoly money compared to the infinite worth of what Jesus Christ offers us in the kingdom of God. Infinitely greater. Nothing can compare to the kind of fruit that is through the saving of souls. I mean, the Apostle Paul understood it in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. He looked at the Philippians as poor as he was and says, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Do you know the Apostle Paul liked jewelry? He liked good bling. He looked at the human souls that he had won and said, my crown, that's my jewelry. That's where my wealth is. That's more valuable to me than gold bricks. You know, brothers and sisters, is that your heart as well? Do you look at all the perishable things of this world and envy those who have gold and silver and houses and luxurious possessions? None of that can compare to the eternal preciousness of the possessions that Jesus Christ offers us in his eternal kingdom. No. I mean, what are you living for? Is the entirety of your life spent on developing your business, stocking up for retirement, guarding your nice house, looking forward to the next social gathering, so you can hang out with people who you like? Or do you think, as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, yes, Lord, all I have is yours. Don't let me be hardened by the deceitfulness of riches, but guard me through your word and help me to keep my mind fixed on the task that you have laid out for me. You have called me to do this, to live this way in life. And whether I'm a preacher and teacher or I'm a toilet cleaner, I do all things heartily as for the Lord and not for men. I serve him, and if I should suffer as a result of my faith, help me to consider it to be a light, momentary affliction that is preparing for me an eternal weight of glory till the day that I see you again. See, that's the Christian heart. We are on the winning side, brothers and sisters. We know what the outcome of the game is. I don't know who's going to win the Super Bowl, but I do know who's going to win this game. Jesus has promised us already that we will win. The church will not be stopped. The church will advance. And even if it looks like it's retreating on certain fronts, the gospel of the kingdom will continue to advance and it will eventually circle back and around as well and take over the world. Many thought that Christianity was decimated when Islam swept through the Arabian Peninsula, through North Africa, and pushed even onto the doors of Europe. Many wondered if Christianity would ever return to the Middle East. And you look today at what is happening in Iran 
You look at what is happening in all these countries that have been dominated by other faiths. Look what is happening in India, and you realize it's not human ingenuity and effort. It is the unstoppable power of the mustard seed of God. The church will prevail because our God is all-powerful, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is unstoppable. You know, if you're a brother or sister here, can I encourage you to invest your life in what truly matters and join the work. Join the work and invest your life in what eternally matters. You know, if you don't know Jesus here and you've heard what I've had to say, you know, I, I want to urge you to seriously consider the claims of Jesus, the truths that are revealed here. You've been looking perhaps in all the wrong places, you know, in life, trying to find some sort of meaning as well, but ultimate meaning, true joy, true happiness, true forgiveness, reconciliation with God, and eternal life, it's only found here. It's only here. And you can see it. You can see it in the changed lives of people who have really met the real Jesus. You want to know that Jesus lives? Look at his fingerprints on the lives of people around you, those whom you know who are Christians, who are different because of him. You know, if you would only confess your sins and bow your knee before him, he will make you new. The Lord calls today, all of us here, to repent of our sins and to turn ourselves back to him and be a part of his unstoppable kingdom. Once you have seen, you can't unsee. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a massive privilege it is to be an ambassador for Jesus to be able to participate in such powerful and extensive and soul-satisfying work. Father, I pray, O oh God, that you would help us not to waste our lives. Help us to remember that every dish washed in Jesus' name, every rug scrubbed, every child who is cared for, every person counseled and comforted, every lost soul that is reached with the gospel is a service done to you that you delight in, an investment in eternity. Father, there is not a single one of us with the giftings we have been given whose work is unseen or insignificant to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. So, Father, I ask, O oh God, that your work would bear fruit here. I ask not only here in Westland, but also in Vancouver, that your kingdom would advance to the praise of your glory. I pray that for Canada, oh Lord, that one day you would give us a revival here and that many of us will return to our Christian heritage and roots. The truth from your word that gave us many of the great things that we enjoy in our society and country. Please, Father, in your mercy, nothing is too hard for you. Would you, even as the love of many grows cold, oh God, ignite the hearts of individuals who want to know you. Father, we submit this time to you. We praise you. We thank you for the preciousness of your word. Convict us, shape us, transform us, and send us out. In Jesus' name.